Has the Ukraine war made the European Union more coherent and more united, or has it, on the contrary, exposed divisions and incoherence within the European Union? That's the subject I'll be discussing with the chair of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, today. I'm the director of the Federal Trust, Brendan Donnelly. John, I'd like to discuss this issue under three headings, uh, energy security, diplomatic activity, and future security policy. It's a long-term goal of the European Union to have a a united European energy policy. Are we nearer to that goal at the end of this year than we were at the beginning, or is it the other way around? Well, there's no question that the war in Ukraine and the loss of uh, Russian uh, gas supplies has had a dramatic impact on uh, the European energy picture and has forced uh, the process of creating an integrated energy market, which has been a a long-term goal of the European Union. I think it's too early to tell precisely how this will play out, but we are much closer to addressing the issue, certainly, of an internal market for energy um, inside the European Union. How the European Union is able to coordinate the shortfalls which are going to be pronounced next year in gas particularly uh, remains to be seen that is still very much work in progress how do you see the timeline on that there are observers who think that the next couple of months are going to be particularly crucial and particularly um, challenging if we have a uh, an inclement if we have a, a severe winter um, in in europe well that is true um Although I think the real challenge is not now or through this winter, because reserves of gas have been built up and the efficiency of the response by member states uh, has, I think, exceeded expectations. The, The real problem comes next year when we won't, we assume, be able to use Russian gas at all to replenish stocks and will be therefore dependent entirely on uh, other sources. And there is plenty of gas in the world, but the question is, what price will we be able to replace Russian supplies? And that, again, uh, remains work in progress because clearly it will be advantageous for the European Union to coordinate its purchasing of uh, new gas uh, resources. And we still have not yet seen the extent to which that will be able to play out. Whichever way it works out, you're anticipating, as everybody is, um, higher energy prices in the long term. What sort of implications will that have for the general economic model of the European Union, and in particular for the economic model which Germany has followed over the past um, decades? Well, clearly, higher energy prices in the short and medium term is what we face. And that will be a very significant challenge. It's already a very significant challenge for the the German industrial model in particular, which is very much focused on access to cheap Russian gas. Uh, The longer term picture, however, is rather different. I think that if the impact of this crisis is to accelerate the European transition to renewables, which uh, will over time be much cheaper than fossil fuels, and particularly with the advances that are being made in solar, for example, which is of particular relevance for Southern Europe. So we face a a transitional problem, in essence. And if this crisis, as I think it will, accelerates this push into uh, renewables, then we will have a positive impact comparable to that which happened in the 1970s with the energy crisis then, where European industries were forced to become more energy efficient and more competitive in a way that, for example, US industries were not. And that led to a situation where the deindustrialization in the United States was more pronounced in the 80s and 90s than it was in continental Europe. Do you think there's any chance of a a political and social kickback against the idea of the Green Revolution? Are people going to try and return to um, more traditional, dirtier forms of energy? I don't think that is really uh, very credible because uh, the costs of uh, restoring capacity in coal, for example, 
are enormous and would not be justified even if you had a uh, a sig significant uh, relaxation of concerns over climate change. No, the, the real question is whether um, we were able to create the capital base to make the very significant infrastructure investments in alternative energies in due time and in an orderly manner. Uh, and that I think is, is really the issue. And that does present quite a significant challenge, but it's one which Europe is actually better equipped than many other places to address because it is a, a very capital intensive and industrially orientated uh, set of investments. Let's turn to the diplomatic um, side of the Ukraine war. Um, Europe sometimes given the impression of, of being rather disunited. The French are doing one thing, the Germans are doing another, the Italians yet another. Is that a, a, a fair impression or, or is there a, an underlying coordination between what sometimes seems to be different initiatives? Well, I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine has obviously been an enormous shock to uh, the European uh, policy of uh, peaceful engagement as uh, economic engagement with Russia as a way of um, ensuring uh, security in Europe. And there has clearly been a different reaction in the West of the European Union compared to the East in, in terms of that. There's been a greater readiness in the West to uh, avoid um, accepting the full consequences of Russia essentially cutting its economic connections more or less entirely with the European Union. But beneath this, that difference is a much a greater degree of unity, a sense that Russia does represent a strategic threat now, maybe with China in the background, and that this requires a coordinated European response, and one which is perhaps uh, less dependent on the ultimate security guarantees through NATO provided by the United States. Whenever people talk about foreign policy and uh, a more coordinated European foreign policy, the question of vetoes always comes up. Um, do, you, do you think there's any possibility of the European Union moving away from its consensual, unanimity, unanimity based uh, model of foreign policy making? Oh, yes, I do. Um, but not immediately, because clearly the current crisis uh, dominates everything and is essentially. Uh, a, a short-term, day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month process. And until it's clear what the outcome of the crisis in Ukraine um, is, I think it will be very difficult to, um, to make any uh, changes of, to treaties and the political process that that would entail. But I do think that part of ensuring a long-term peace in Ukraine will be a coordinated European Union approach to Ukraine, and not just that of granting Ukraine uh, status as a potential member state, which is where we are already. Um, but I think it would be more than that. It would also affect the internal operations of the European Union. As far as security policy is concerned, uh, obviously the, the invasion of Ukraine has produced a revolution there. Sweden and Finland joining joining NATO, um, the Germans um, talking about um, increasing very substantially their defence expenditure. Um, where's that going? I, I, is it all rhetoric that gradually will will disappear, or, or, or are there concrete um, changes of um, uh, of approach and, and budgeting and um, projections for the future? No, I certainly think it is a very substantial change, and um, that is the really big story to come out of. Uh, the Ukraine crisis is German rearmament and a wider European rearmament and the desire that German rearmament takes place within a European context and how that plays out, how the money is spent on what um, facilities, what uh, capabilities and within what structure is it spent. Um, that is the, the issue going forward. And I think what we're working towards is a, in, an integrated European pillar 
within NATO uh, with a significantly higher uh, European contribution, one which would be comparable to the United States so that you could speak of NATO becoming a duopoly of uh, Europe and America operating to much closer to a status of equality between the two. Obviously, um, Ukraine isn't the only issue, although it's a dominant issue. Um, how economically is the European Union shaping up, do you think? Uh, will it be well placed to, to contribute to the um, reconstruction of, of Ukraine after the war? Well, investing in the reconstruction of Ukraine will be uh, a sound proposition going forward, provided a security structure can be created and provided uh, there are prospects of a change in, in Russia and the diminution of the Russian threat um, in, a, uh, in the medium term. Uh, so I, I don't regard the, the challenges, uh, financial challenges, which are certainly very substantial, of rebuilding the post-war Ukrainian economy as necessarily a problem. In fact, I think it could represent a very significant boost to the European Union economy in the medium term. That Ukraine could be a very wealthy country indeed. And as a member state of the European Union, it solves a whole range of uh, potential problems that Europe has, whether we're looking at food security or energy security or uh, water resources and all the rest. So I, I, I think that this has to be put in perspective, but everything depends on how the war ends and um, what the future position of Russia is vis-a-vis -vis the European Union um, and its alternative, which is the uh, closer relationship that it's developing at the moment with China. And what progress has there been on the further integration of the Eurozone over the past year? Well, clearly the challenges of firstly uh, dealing with the aftermath of the COVID crisis and then the energy uh, transformation that is required by climate change that has been hugely accelerated by the uh, crisis in Ukraine do pose enormous uh, financial issues for the European Union, which can only really be solved, and this is generally recognised, by a more integrated approach. And so that is providing an underpinning for the further development of the Eurozone, even if, as yet, some of the crucial elements of that um, are yet to be uh, fleshed out. And there is no question that there will be a significant shift of borrowing away from it being done by individual member states to a more collective pattern, though on precisely what terms that will take place um, remains uh, open. And that will inevitably strengthen the, the, the Eurozone. I also think that a rising interest rate environment um, accelerates that because it makes it uh, much more attractive for uh, weaker European states, weaker members of the Eurozone, uh, to uh, participate fully, to stick to the rules of the uh, Eurozone criteria, because this is a way of, of uh, insulating themselves from the impact of dramatically higher interest rates. And it is quite significant that um, if you compare, for example, what has happened to Swedish interest rates compared to what has happened to Italian ones, um, the benefits of being in the eurozone are quite clear in a rising interest rate environment has the ukraine uh, war distracted attention from the question which was before the war a very a pertinent one for the european union that of the rule of law and the way in which uh, a couple of countries in particular um, seem to have a, an ambiguous and uncertain relationship with european and, and indeed any other kind of law uh, how, how do you see that as uh, as panning out over the next couple of years? Well, clearly there is this deep uh, cultural uh, divide um, between Eastern and Western Europe in some crucial respects, in particular towards uh, the uh, embedding of uh, 
democrat mainstream democratic values and uh, the rule of law and uh, this is obviously particularly the case in 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 Poland and in and in Hungary um and it's difficult to imagine these being directly addressed as long as we have the current crises dominating the agenda but just as uh, we were discussing earlier whether it would be uh, timely at some stage to address the question of uh, majority voting in foreign policy questions and a treaty change that that would entail. And I think also there will be uh, further uh, efforts made uh, at the level of a treaty change uh, to come to a, some arrangement that will address the challenges that are currently posed by uh, the, the attitudes of of the Polish government, this Polish government, and the current uh, government in Hungary. But this is something which is not going to happen immediately. But it's quite clear that we are moving towards a situation where a redefinition of crucial elements of the European Union um, are going to be put on the agenda. On the whole, your assessment is that the European Union is a bit more united at the end of 2022 than it was at the beginning. Um, do you think it will be more united still at the end of 2023? What are the prospects there? Well, all the force of current events is towards greater integration. That is the, the logic. And the Ukraine war has certainly accelerated that in, in a whole range of ways, uh, notably uh, defence. But also, I think the integration of the euro and the economic underpinning uh, that that entails. And I also think that the global um, consequences of the current crisis, um, which is seeing a reversal, the acceleration of, a re of the reversal, which has been underway for a while, um, away from globalization and towards regionalization, this being pushed by the geostrategic position being pushed by climate change considerations, the onshoring that is taking place um, both in Europe and in the United States um, is going to assist the integration of the European market uh, because it will make the single market much more important for all its participants relative to uh, trade outside the single market. I and mean, one of the things that uh, led to the Eurozone's creation uh, under delivering on some of the expectations that had been uh, entailed in its creation was the fact that it coincided with the tremendous growth of, of China and the other Asian economies, which meant that Germany, for example, became much more exposed to its exports outside the European Union single market than internally. And this diminished to a degree the, the extent to which the deepening of the single market was a major theme of, of European economic evolution. We're now in a situation where large internal markets, whether it be the European Union, the United States, or for that matter, China, um, is where the future lies. And being outside those blocks is going to become increasingly uncomfortable. This is obviously very relevant for Brexit Britain. And so the whole trend of global economics and geopolitics at the moment is leading towards a deepening of the logic of European integration. I heard a comparison for the European Union, um, an amusing and illustrative one recently. Um, somebody said that it's like a, a flock of birds which is apparently uh, quarrelling and um, flapping and going in different directions. And you think, oh, well, they're, they're completely divided. And then uh, a couple of days later, you look at the birds again and they're still flapping around, but they're two miles further down the road without your noticing it. And I think that's a, a good uh, illustration of the way in which the European Union, um, uh, a pluribus unum sometimes, um, uh, it, they say, but, um, but it's actually order from chaos. And I think that um, the, you, the institutional structure of the European Union is the um, phenomenon which brings about that order. And that's something that has often been underestimated in the United Kingdom. John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope that um, our viewers have found this an interesting discussion and that they'll want to look at some of our other discussions on the Federal Trust website. 
I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I would hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.